All righty. Hello. Um, I'm here to talk about the GT40. Um, it is the 50th anniversary of this particular game. Uh, it was written 50 years ago. And so um, I've been thinking about this for probably the last couple of years and thinking it was a, a good idea to try to kind of coordinate it to be on the 50th anniversary and sh uh, take it around the country. Um, I'm originally from the Bay Area. And so I actually drove it out in a minivan with my dog and got it out here uh, so you guys could play the, the machine um, uh, today, hopefully today or tomorrow. Um, <clears throat> at any rate, so, um, but there's two of us working on it, myself and Fritz Mueller, who wasn't able to come uh, today. He had other commitments, um, but he's uh, worked on it as well, and I'll get into more of the details. <clears throat> so kind of going back in time, uh, Apollo 11 landed on the moon July 20, 1969. And so you know, the, the moon landings, everything about astronauts was all the rage amongst kids. You know, I was a kid at that time and stuff like that. So naturally, you know, they're going to have games that come out about the whole idea of being on the moon or landing on the moon. And so um, the first game was written uh, in a focal programming language for a deck computer, PDP-8. I'm sure there's a lot of PDP-8 fans here. Um, at any rate, but that, that was kind of the start of this game um, written by a high school student, if you can believe it, uh, in, in fall of 69. So at any rate, and then of course, uh, Dave All and his great work uh, converted to BASIC and published in his um, books about BASIC games um, that were quintessential in that particular time period for BASIC. Um, and so, so the Lunar Lander game kind of looked like this. Uh, you basically had instructions and you're trying to land it. Uh, the computer has failed. So you're up to doing it manually. Um, and you basically, in this game, all you can do is adjust the amount of thrust you're giving. And so it's a text-based output, and it gives you at zero seconds, you know, you're going this particular speed, you're at this particular height. How much, you know, burn rate of fuel do you want to use as you try to slow down the vehicle and land on the moon? Uh, and so then in 19, October of 1972, uh, DEC created a, what they called low-cost, $11,000, so that's about $80,000 today, uh, terminal that would be used to do graphic things, like they show a, a chart here, uh, some trend lines or whatever. And uh, the idea was to do this. And it was a pretty powerful um, display uh, in that it could draw, actually draw the lines. So rather than just being a digital DAC and doing dots on the screen, um, it could actually do line drawing and, and fonts and things like that in vector graphics. Um, and, but to do that, it needed a pretty powerful processor. So it used a PDP 1110 or 1105 uh, with 16K of memory, 8K bytes of core. Um, and you know, it was a speci uh, specially designed hardware display and the monitor that went with it. Um, some of the unique things, it had a light pen for interacting with the screen um, and some graphic characters. Uh, and it could run standalone, which is how the game runs, uh, or it could actually talk to host computers through various libraries for like Fortran or uh, Focal or whatever. Um, so this is the the literature sheet for the the Jack the sorry the Deck GT40 terminal, and um, so then it came out in October, and you know there's always a, a thing you want to show off your hardware. What can it do? And so Deck commissioned. Uh, a gentleman, Jack Ber Burness, to basically write a game, write something that would showcase this particular terminal. And so he came up with the idea of Moonlander. And uh, this particular game takes advantage of all the features like the, the ability to draw uh, dotted and dashed lines, the ability to um, intensify, um, to have blinking things, uh, blinking text, italics text, uh, and also the light pen interface. And so the way you control the Moonlander is with the light pen. Um, so that's, that was kind of unique uh, as well. And uh, so the idea was that it would showcase the capabilities of this graphic terminal. And because the program lived in core, they could load it once and ship it with the game or whatever. And it would just, you know, when you turn it on, it would just run the game immediately. <clears throat> so this is actually, this was taken at a VCF many, many years ago, I think in the early 2000s, of, of this exact machine that's here today. Uh, so uh, I don't know if this was east or west um, for the VCF, but anyway. And then this is somebody, you know, obviously using uh, the game back in the 60s, early 70s. Uh, and, and you can see a close-up. He's holding the light pen, and it's kind of blurry, but those are arrows pointing different directions, long or short, for large amounts of turn or small amount. And then you see a vertical bar uh, with a little stub sticking out to the side above it. And that's the throttle. As you move the pen up, up and down on the throttle, it changes the amount of thrust that the little lander ex uh, is exerting to compensate gravity. Uh, and so Atari saw this and 
uh, basically six years later, they took the same hardware. It's a it's a digital vector generator, um, and they cost reduced it and used a simpler CPU and basically re released a arcade game um, that actually kept score and had lives. The original game has no scoring; it just keeps re replaying. You know, if you crash, it just gives you another ship forever. Uh, although I did find out last night that if you let the game run for hours and hours and hours, eventually it'll run out of memory because it keeps storing all the crashes on the moon and then it has no more money, it crashes. And so uh, it crashed last night around six o'clock or whatever. Um, and so I didn't understand what was going on, but uh, uh, at any rate, so Atari did that. Uh, so their game has, like I said, score, a number of lives, different mechanisms down at the bottom to do the modes that you fly the game and make it easier or harder to land the lander or the lunar lander. That's the actual arcade cabinet. And they used a thruster, obviously, rather than a light pen, and then buttons to rotate the the uh, left and right. Uh, so anyway, that's kind of the history of it. Now um, the idea was to, hey, let's let's take a GT40. I had actually found somebody uh, on a collector who had one uh, that didn't work. And we thought, okay, let's repair this thing and get it ready for California Extreme, which happened about two weeks ago, August 18th. And uh, we'd bring it there and we'd show it to all these game, you know, people who like uh, different games. Because this is kind of a quintessential game it's the probably the second really arcade game space war was the first lunar lander was probably the second um that really kind of started this whole arcade game thing going um so this is our this is our gt40 and it, it's kind of hard to see from the picture but it has something called screen rot and uh, this particular i think it's the hp terminal um has it a lot worse and basically what it is is before they had safety glass they would have the crt screen and then they put this clear plastic um gel that would harden i think it's called pva and then they put another piece of glass in front so if the tube exploded that plastic would absorb the shards because it'd be very sharp because it's not safety glass and protect the user and but the problem is over time moisture gets in there and if moisture's in there eventually it'll mold and so you get this, this, and it's just basically non-repairable. You have to basically take it apart. And so that was my job. So we split the task. I was going to take care of the monitor, and Fritz was going to take care of the PDP-1105 and the VT-11 graphic boards. So I, I um, read up on how to do this and reached out to some folks at the Rhode Island Computer Museum of Rhode Island Computer Museum in Rhode Island, and um, they gave me some tips of how to do it. And um, so obviously the first step is remove the CRT and get it out there because we got to get that front metal band off so we can separate it and get that PV, PVA stuff out. Well, it turns out that that's sealed in silicon glue, uh, silicon sealant. And you can't dissolve that with anything. You know, it doesn't, you can't use like acetone to dilute it or whatever. Um, it's really, you just kind of have to cut it out. But it's so tight, you can't really cut it out. So it turns out they make this, silicon digester which basically just eats the silicon and so i took hypodermic needles and i'm squirting it in there and zacto blade trying to get it out and over about a week of just doing this every day um finally the ring just snaps off and uh you can see the kind of the white is the silicone that i've been getting out of there and eventually i was successful and thinking hey this is great i got the tube off got the pva off the crt is all clean you can see the the shield in front is is um is good to go but now it's all glass it's you know non-safety glass it's crt glass and the front glass and so there's a safety risk there and you know i'm going to be driving across country to chicago and i don't want the thing to you know explode or whatever and send shards of glass everywhere so um the folks at rhode island computer uh museum basically said well the thing to do is to take that that uh, front glass curved plate that you see there on the right and put that, flip it over, uh, concave, and stick it in the oven at 325 and melt a piece of Lexan that'll sink to this. I'm like, oh, that sounds pretty simple. Well, it really wasn't. Uh, <laughs> as, it, it, you know, so fortunately it didn't break. Um, I was very paranoid about that. But um, it wasn't cooperating. It would get like air bubbles and then it would, it would hit the glass and the glass is frosted. And so then it would frost the clear plastic and make it, it would be no longer transparent. It'd be translucent, but not transparent. And 
And then uh, I thought, well, you know, it's maybe it's just not hot enough. And so I got it too hot and it started bubbling. And so that didn't work. And so I think I went through like 11 sheets of Lexan um, and finally realized the correct way to do it. You see how the, the piece is bigger is, and I don't have a, a picture of that, but basically is to trim it almost exactly to the size of the glass um, uh, piece that I'm trying to conform to because it doesn't really shrink that much. And when I did that, it sagged just enough and didn't touch the glass that I could use that as a blast shield. So after a week or maybe two of just cursing this thing, I finally got it all put back together and it looks really great. It came out really nice. And uh, I was very fortunate in that once I put it all together, uh, Deck has excellent documentation and Bit Savers is where you can find all this stuff. And I'll go into that a little bit later. But um, um, they had a procedure of like, well, how do you bring up this terminal from scratch? It's like, okay, well, first you disconnect the yoke and the CRT and you bring up the power supplies and you check that. And then you check that the deflection amp's working and these things. And you just walk through this this step-by-step -step guide to make sure everything is okay. And fortunately for me, nothing was broken. And I was able to get a diagonal line on the screen uh, by feeding a sine wave into both X and Y. So it's like, okay, great, the, my work is done. Hey, I'm, I'm set to go. So Fritz, at the same time, is now working on the diagnosing the GT40, which was not in that great a shape. It didn't run, um, and it had a number of issues that we had to work through. Um, fortunately, again, DEC has lots of great tools uh, and you can see the board with the little red LEDs on there is a board that allows you to kind of micro step through the, the code, the micro code on the processor and debug problems. And so Fritz was making good progress and he identified a uh, one bad part and we were able to take it from another machine, another board that we had and fix that. And that fixed that problem. And we just kept working through it. And we're like a week out now. We've got like four days, five days. I think it's Sunday and the show Calvary Extreme starts Saturday. And um, so we're kind of really up against the, 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 the finish line trying to get it done. And um, so, the, you know, I delivered the monitor. He's working on this and working through it. And um, yeah, and then he's not feeling well. And lo and behold, he gets COVID. So uh, <laughs> we're like, oh, man. Uh, so fortunately, he didn't get it that bad, I guess. And uh, he did pick up. He, we lost a day or two because he just really was out of it and uh, uh, really couldn't think straight. And so anyway, but he, we were able to get back to it. And um, it was looking pretty promising because we could get you can't see it on there. It says at the bottom, this is a very good sign uh, because the vector was working. Uh, the vector generator, the processor was working. And uh, then we wanted to draw, draw a box and great. And so now it's like Friday, um, Friday afternoon, the show's tomorrow. We're thinking, hey, we got a shot at this. This is looking really good. And um, at any rate, and so I called him up and said, hey, you know, Anchor Electronics closes in like an hour. Is there anything else we need to buy? You know, are we good on parts? He's like, no, no, we should be fine. And then, of course, at 6 p.m., and they closed at 5, or they closed at 4, um, we had a microcode prom failure and we didn't have any spare parts. So anyway, I had to share this slide with uh, the California Extreme folks saying, hey, we'll see you next year. We'll have it working, um, but uh, we'll have demos and you can play with the light pen. Um, but if you want to follow along our restoration, these are the, the uh, web pages uh, where there's uh, stuff up. I don't have mine up yet for Tattler Solutions, but Fritz does have some stuff for GitHub. So, okay. So we missed that deadline. So new goal. All right, so we got VCF coming up in two weeks. So let's try to get working for that because that was the original goal was to bring it to you guys. That was my whole goal is I believe that this VCF, I've been to a number of them, east, west, southeast, northwest, um, and I feel like this is the best one. And so I thought, hey, I really want to bring it to this. And so I've been planning this for a year. So anyway, complete the restoration in time for VCF. So the problem was Fritz now is works on the big uh, radio telescope they're building down in Chile. It's part of Slack, and so he's literally leaving on Monday after this uh, after uh, California Extreme, so he can't work on it anymore. So I'm like, okay, well, um, so I need to take over now restoring the PDP-11, which I've never done before, and so I um, uh, sorry, oh, we're doing great on time. Okay, um, so. Uh, I got to do this. So first step is um, go to BitSavers. And for those of you, I'm sure you guys know about it, but if you don't, it's it's the work done by 
Al Casal of um, formerly of Apple, but I think of um, Computer History Museum, uh, who is just uh, him and a lot of other people have basically created this repository of all the documentation of whatever they could find for all these computer systems, whether they're PDP-11 or Sun Microsystems or whatever. They've just collected it over the decades, and we have this repository, so you can go and find the original manuals that have been scanned into PDFs. And, you know, this work wouldn't be possible without this, um, without these manuals. It just makes it so much easier. And so, of course, I downloaded all the manuals and, and started to have those available. And so now it's my house uh, set up, and... Um, uh, I've got to do the the um, the repair. So the first step in the repair is to replace this prom that was bad. Well, hopefully you can go to BitSavers and download the prom, the image, and you pop it in your part and you program it and you're done. But unfortunately, that was not the case. Um, there, there's good documentation, so you actually have to go to the paper copies uh, of the proms and basically manually copy the data from this page into this little part. So there's 256 entries and it's a four bit prom. And so the address is on the left. Of course, it's not in order. So we have one and it's an octal. So we have 145 and then 015 and 147 and 146. So it's all over the place. And then um, and then you have the bits over there that are circled 0110 or whatever it is. And we have to type that in so I can load it in my prom programmer and program the part. So Fritz had basically manually transcribed this in and um, and sent me the file that sh you know should be the proms, um, but uh, one of my rules is I worked for Qualcomm and then for Tesla Motors, and uh, uh, one of the things I used to go over was you know when you're working in these pressure cooker environments like Tesla or Qualcomm, um, you know you really have to. There's one important thing is not to trust anybody, and it sounds really negative, but it isn't. It just means you really need to check that you know it's right. Can you say that this thing I did that I know it's right? And um, so, of course, Fritz, who's very detail oriented and a very sharp guy, and you know, normally I wouldn't, you know, doubt it, but don't trust anybody. Just check the problem. Go back to the listings and make sure it's right. And sure enough, I found a couple of uh, uh, kind of transpositions of two lines that would have uh, caused a problem and it wouldn't have worked. <clears throat> and um, you know, I don't mean to throw Fritz on the bus. He's obviously he's not here. Uh, but I, I kind of chalk it up to COVID because that's when the COVID was kind of happening because uh, he's very detail oriented. But it's an important thing that when you're doing this thing, you know, it's important to have a partner to help you so you can cross check. But it's so important to say, do I know it's right? Do I know that this problem that I'm putting in there is right? Because if it isn't, you could put a one bit error in there, put one wrong value in this little part, one bit, and it's going to create a subtle bug that you're just going to spend weeks trying to find. And so you really have to just triple check your work and say, okay, I'm putting this problem in and I know it's right. And so I went through and uh, once I did his thing, I went through and uh, tried to get my girlfriend to help me. And she's like, no, no, I'm not doing that. I'm not reading all these numbers. So I just very carefully checked again and again. And so I could say, yes, I know that the values in that prom are absolutely correct as to what DEC published. Now, whether the documentation is correct, I don't know. But at least I can say, I, between the two of us, we have faithfully transposed or translated that text document into the prom. And lo and behold, the, the machine starts working again. So we're back to the success. So I'm thinking, OK, great. I'm not that far away. So let's, you know, DEC has lots of great diagnostics. Again, bit savers. Um, has collected a lot of these. This one was on a, there's a site called Brouhaha that actually has a lot of GT40 history. This, the diagnostics were on that site. Um, they're the quintessential, you know, uh, expert on all the stuff of GT40. And they're actually talking about GT40 that we have. So I start the download and in the middle of it, and, you know, it takes like 30 minutes to download Lun Lunar Lander. So in the middle of this diagnostic, which takes about 15 minutes, it basically hangs and fails. And I'm like, you know, I have no idea where I'm going to go. I mean, like, what is it I'm going to do, you know, because it's, it's, you know, hundreds or thousands of bytes into the download that it fails. And, you know, I'm not a PDP-11 expert. I just, I have no clue. So I'm kind of thinking and praying about it. And uh, it, I, the idea comes that maybe go back to the fact that when we hit, when we type text and we hit line feed, the machine would hang. Like, okay, well, great. That's a, a, a singular error. I can get to it easily. Let's fix the line feed character and we'll come back to downloading. You know. So the good news is there's all this documentation. It's printed out. And so we, I stepped through the code 
And um, there's a there's a uh, line in yellow. I don't know if you guys can read it, but basically it's a comparison register deferred auto increment. So we're going to take the 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 register R3. It has an address in it. We're going to look at that address, and we're going to we're going to compare it to the value in R0, which happens to be a line feed character. And then once we're done, we're going to increment to the next address, and um, we're going to do this comparison. And uh, this comparison, even though the address, which is an odd address that it's pointing to, um, does have a line feed there, and the character's line feed, it says, no, it's not equal. It fails. And um, at any rate, um, so if I continue down the code, the blue line says, OK, well, if you didn't find a line feed, keep looking. And if you keep looking and come to the end, just go back up the top and start over. And so it just sits there forever looking for this line feed when and it finds one and it says, oh, that's not a line feed and it just keeps going. So it just hangs. So that's really good. That's a great error because it's really consistent. It's not, you know, um, intermittent. It just fails every time. So, okay. So now the next step is, so I'm single stepping through the front panel and doing the little switches of step, 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 or continue, continue. And now DEC in this particular computer has the ability to step through the microcode. So we have that one instruction, which might be made up of, say, um, well, there's multiple steps to it. But first, we have to fetch the instruction, and that may be a couple of commands. And then we have to kind of load, get the registers ready. And then we do the, you know, the comparison. And so I'm stepping through the microcode, and I get to this shift. And this is the microcode. So what it's telling you is the little lights on there at the bottom are telling you the address of the next instruction. So for example, on this page, it says at the top, it says we're at location 067, and the next instruction is 346. So if I were to look on this, it doesn't really say it there, but it would say 346 on the LEDs, and so I'd know where I was, and I could just literally, which I did, is I would single step through these instructions of we're basically just bit shifting because it's reading uh, 16 bits, but the byte that we want is on the upper side, sorry, the upper side, and we need to shift it down to the lower side. So it's doing that, but at the same time, it's, it's shifting. One of the bits is broken, and it's shifting in a one. So all of a sudden, I get down to the bottom. And instead of having 10 for the line feed carry, I have 15. And because it's basically set all the bits to one as we slide our way down. So obviously, that's why 10 does not equal 15. That's why it always fails. So sure enough, I replace a bad uh, 74, 194, four bit shifter, and I can do line two. And uh, it's working. So now uh, let's, do, let's get back to the downloading, right? So let's download a diagnostic to see what we can fix. And again, it fails. And um, at any rate, but in this case, it doesn't show in this picture, but it was interesting. I could read the first four characters of the of the characters. It started spitting out after, because once it, it, it uh, the download fails, it goes back into terminal mode and just spits characters to the screen. And so I could read the first four characters. You can't on this one, but I could. And it uh, gets back to rule number one, don't trust anybody. Okay, so I got these these diagnostics from Bruhaha, the GT40 quintessential page. And, you know, they're the diagnostics and they should work, right? There shouldn't be a problem with those. It should be my problem. It should be my hardware. But no, it turns out that for whatever reason, the diagnostics have an extra uh, exclamation line feed character in the, the, the GT files. So they would never work. So I don't care if you have the, a perfectly working GT40. These files, all these diagnostics will never work. So you have to go in there with Notepad or Notepad++ and cut out that line feed. It should be one continuous line. And then, boom. OK, now I got the test panel. I'm like, wow, things are looking great. This is super exciting, right? And uh, you can see I've got the light pin on there. I don't know if you can read it in the middle. It says light pin hit. So as you move the light pin across those horizontal bars, it'll say, I saw that, that thing. So here is the actual demo running. Is it going to do it? Yeah, so this is the demo that it... All right, and then I load an another diagnostic, which is for the light pen, which I thought was kind of cool. And so you get the light pen, and now you can drag it around the screen. So that was working. So I'm thinking, wow, this is super exciting. And uh, okay, so that things are looking really good and thinking, okay, let's load Lunar Lander. And I load it in there and lo and behold, it runs. 
uh, and you see an explosion at the end. Um, but something's messed up. It, you know, the, the graphics aren't right. And oh, you can see it coming down. That's the spaceship, and it doesn't quite look like a spaceship. There's something wrong. So I've got another ship to fix. Uh, so now we're at two. This is going to be the third one. And lo and behold, I replaced that part, and it fixes the Lunar Lander game, and you can actually play it. Um, so at any rate, so this is the game, and uh, that was restoration. So at that point, the game is completely working. Um, so And I brought it here, and I'll go into some uh, more of the details on that. Um, so going back to the game itself, so I come in and you're at, at some height and you're going to use the light pen over on the right hand side, you see, uh, the arrows and you see the vertical bar where you'll touch it with the light pen and it'll change the rotation of the lander. And it also will change the thrust as you move the bar up and down, it will change. And the idea is to slow the lander down and level it out so that now you're coming down slowly. I'm still coming down really fast, uh, about 240, uh, in the vertical speed. But horizontal, I'm not moving side. And lo and behold, I can land it. Okay, and so it's landed down there. And you can't see it, but to the, to the left of the lunar lander, there's a little guy who comes out and sticks a flag up. There's an animation, and it says, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. So um, anyway, pretty cool, you know. And, uh, uh, but anyway, there's another piece of history here is about Easter eggs. So uh, I'm sure a lot of you have seen the movie Ready Player One, where they talk about the first Easter egg in the Atari 2600 game Adventure. Um, where the guy, I can't think what his name, let's see, uh, Robin, uh, Warren Robinette. Um, basically, if you do this Easter egg, it prints his name in the game, and it's an Easter egg, right? And so people find it, and it's considered the first Easter egg, and that was in 1979, I think? 1980, 1980. Uh, but this game was in 73, and it actually has the first Easter egg, because this Easter egg actually is a product placement. So there's a McDonald's on the moon. <laughs> and I didn't believe this. You know, I'm like, what? Well, you got to be kidding me. Until I actually found it myself. Um, I actually, this is me landing on it. Um, but at any rate, yes, indeed, you can land uh, at the McDonald's. And you can kind of fly around. And I haven't figured out exactly where it is on the screen. I just kind of came across it. Uh, if you slow down enough, you can kind of fly sideways. And um, <clears throat> anyway, so there's a McDonald's there. And it says... <clears throat> two cheeseburgers and a Big Mac to go, right? <laughs> and so he'll walk out, he'll get the bag, and they'll come back, and then the Lunar Lander will actually take off, which was really cool, and fly back up, and then the game resets, and then it comes in again. And so this is actually the first Easter egg, and there's a YouTube video, you can Google it or whatever, about the first Easter egg. So this is technically the very first Easter egg. Now, it wasn't a programmer's name, but it was a product placement, and the funny thing about the product placement is uh, you think, oh, well, McDonald's are everywhere, right? So it's kind of a, a ubiquitous thing. But at this time, there weren't that many McDonald's in 1973. Um, there was one in my neighborhood. But um, uh, but he even misspelled it. He spelled M-A-C Donald's and, uh, in one of the texts that's in there. Uh, so they weren't that, that uh, pop. Uh, they weren't that prevalent, I guess. Uh, but they did exist. So at any rate... Um, so that's basically the story of the Lunar Lander and its restoration. I have one here. Uh, I'll get to questions in a second. Um, I have one here, and it was working all day yesterday. And it was working this morning. It's not working right now, and so I apologize. Of course, I wanted to reel it in here and do a live demo, and uh, unfortunately, the gremlins got me, uh, and it's not working, but it will be working uh, later in the show. Uh, it's been pretty consistent lately. Uh, like I said, it ran all day um all day on Friday, I uh, started at 11, and I think it died around uh, 6 p.m. or something. And I think I mentioned earlier that the reason why it died was because it ran out of memory to store all the, the shards of the crashed ships. Um, and uh, I don't know if y you guys remember, but back in, I think, 2019, uh, Steve Hemenover uh, did a talk on the work that I did and with him, that we both did, to restore the Death Star plan computer, the PP-11, that drew the Death Star plans. So his shop is here in Elk Grove Village, and so we thought it'd be a neat thing to have the two computers side by side. So this is PDP 1145 with the Vector General running the Death Star plans. You can see the Death Star on the screen, and um, and then you can see the GT40 next to it. So kind of a neat piece of history on vector graphics. And of course, we had to have, in the end, the lightsabers, the dueling light pens of the two <laughs> systems. Uh, so at any rate, uh, more information. Oh, does this? I don't know why that slide's messed up, but uh, there are actually, 
go back. Um, at any rate, um, well, I'll publish the slides, um, but there's more information. Let me see if I can fix that real quick. I don't know why, what happened here? Where is it? Anyway, it, it moved out of the way, but uh, there's a link to Tadler Solutions and to, uh, to the site that you can go to. Uh, I've got another picture of it. You can take a picture here. There we go. Okay, so the bottom two links are uh, a couple of web pages where there'll be uh, the slides will be there. There'll be more information about the restoration and our, our trials and tribulations on that. Um, <clears throat> at any rate, okay. Uh, with that, any questions? Yeah, go ahead, sir. Uh, I've been told that the big mountain to the left, when you start the game, has an invisible hole in it or tunnel that you can fly the lander through. Uh, so the, the question is, uh, he's been told that uh, on the left-hand side, there's a mountain there that apparently has an invisible tunnel. Uh, so that may be true. I haven't, uh, my skills are still kind of so-so on flying the game, but you're welcome to come by and try and see if we can find it. How hard is it to get the old parts for 50? Uh, you got some replacement ICs there. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. The question is, how hard is it to get the parts? And uh, it turned out the the prom wasn't that hard. Um, there's a uh, there's a company called AnchorElectronics.com, Anchor-Electronics.com, and they sell a lot of the 74 series, not 74 LS, but 74 like um, uh, two of the chips that uh, deal with the drawing is uh, it's a binary rate multiplier and a comparator, and that's a 74. Um, 96 and a 7497 and the 96 is really easy to find anchor has it the 97 you have to get from jameco electronics so those are two good sources for these old parts um there's also some folks in the bay area who when one of the electronic stores closed they bought the inventory so they had some parts so if you go on to the forums you know and you're saying hey i'm trying to restore this computer um the VC Fed forums, you can post, and there's probably going to be somebody who has one of these parts lying around. Um, a lot of the people, the good news, a lot of people who are in this hobby are hoarders. And so they've collected everything. <laughs> and uh, one of my favorite hoarders here is Steve Hemenover, um, who did the, the, um, the, the, the Vector General Star Wars project. And because he kept all the documentation and all the spare parts, whenever we had a bro broken part, we'd say, well, well, this one's busted. It's like, well, Steve's got a spare. So uh, we had a head crash and Steve had a spare. So um, part of our success with that project was his collection of parts. And so there are lots of people that have that. And so we rely heavily in the restoration community on these, these relationships we make, meeting people and talking to them. And you know, once you start restoring people, uh, restoring hardware, people respect you for the work that you did. And that opens doors. Like I was able to borrow a GT40. I mean, you know, like there's probably two or three of them in the world and I was able to borrow one so I could restore it and show it to you guys. So um, because of the work I did on the Vector General project, because I showed that, hey, I can do this work. We can make this happen. And um, yeah, so that's where I get that's where you can get parts. But they're out there. Yeah. Yes, sir. Could you um, speak a little bit about your background? Oh, my background. Okay. Uh, my name is Scott Swayze. I'm from originally from San Diego. I'm an electrical engineer out of San Diego State. Um, I, I really loved arcade games or uh, in terms of fixing them. I never really got into playing them, but I really enjoyed fixing them. Um, I worked at uh, Qualcomm for 18 years, from 93 to 2011. And then in two, the beginning of 2012, I moved up to the Bay Area to work for Tesla Motors. And um, I ran their test engineering group. I started with two people and I left uh, in 2016. Um, and I had a group of 70 people. I did all the testing. So any of the circuit boards would built in the circuit boards into modules, modules into battery packs or uh, into motors or into center displays uh, or body controls. I did all the testing on that, all the different apparatuses. My team built all those testers and we tested. We also did the test of the energy power wall, uh, the superchargers, uh, all that stuff. Uh, and it was great. You know, it really is um, uh, a great thing because there's just so many smart people and, you know, like, 
all the people in the room here, it's just exciting to work with people who have this knowledge and you know about something and you work together and it's just a wonderful experience uh, to work with smart people. So um, I did that. And then after that, uh, I kind of retired for about five years and did uh, some church work and did FPGA work. And so I've done a lot of work in making uh, boards, which are on my website. Um, if you have a Tempest machine that's not working, you can put in one of my FP FPGA boards to replace the original board. And I'm all about the faithful feel of it. So it's not an emulator. It's more of a recreation. So if you play that Tempest or Major Havoc or whatever game, it feels exactly like the real thing. And I've had people who are expert players. Jonathan Colpe can play up to level 99, and he can't tell the dis difference. Uh, Owen Rubin, who wrote um, Major Havoc, we had the two games side by side at California Extreme, my FPGA version and the original, and he played both and he couldn't tell the difference. And so, so I've been doing a lot with FPGAs uh, as well. Uh, yeah, so that's kind of what I do. And so I do kind of do consulting work right now. Yes, sir. Regarding the FPGAs, have you talked to any of the online uh, like historical gaming channels? Like uh, I was thinking, like My Life in Gaming or some of the other ones that cover that type of stuff of restoring uh, stuff and getting them to work and stuff like that. That's why I suggested. Uh, no, I haven't. You know, speaking of FPGA, there's a great um, group, uh, the Mister Group. If you guys have heard of that, who've done fantastic work. You know, basically what they've done is there were a bunch of splintered FPGA designs of you know, different games, different consoles, all this stuff. And they built a wrapper that kind of brought it all in together. And so you can load all these different images. You can load an Apple II image. You can load uh, a PDP-1 and play Space War. Um, you can load, uh, you know, um, different uh, arcade games. I think, the, uh, yeah, so it's a wonderful project that, that has done quite a bit for FPGAs. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, oh, yeah, a good question. Okay, so um, one of the things you guys probably are familiar with is stability is everything in these old games, right? You can get them to run, but will they keep running? And so I found out today, <laughs> the answer is no, uh, unfortunately. <laughs> um, but I had really good stability. Um, so believe it or not, I had to leave on Sunday to drive. It took me uh, four days, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. I got here Wednesday evening uh, driving out in my minivan with this GT40 which is very heavy, in the back of my minivan to bring it out to you guys. And when I left, the game mostly worked, but it had kind of some intermittent things. One of the DAX was kind of flaky, but if you just kind of pushed on it and held it down, it would kind of work. And then that thing you saw where the, the images squished on the lander was kind of causing me a problem as well. So I actually got here on Wednesday and on Thursday at Steve's shop over in Elk Grove Village, Aurora Technologies, I basically finished the debug and decided that I had a second, we have a second GT40 so I could steal the DAC. And I didn't really want to take it apart because, you know, it could stop working completely. But I took the risk and lo and behold, when I swapped out the DAC, it became stable. So that problem completely went away with the flakiness of it would bounce at the top lines, you know. But I still had the problem that the game would occasionally do that thing when it would start up, the game would be squished. And then after about four minutes, five minutes, it would go to normal. And so I'm like, okay, that's really good. So I took out some, you know, blow uh, keyboard duster and you turn it upside down and it sprays out the cold spray stuff. And it doesn't cost $15, it costs $3, but it's the same stuff inside. So you flip it upside down. And so what I did is I went each individual chip because it would, it would, it would uh, warm up and it would play fine. So I just went chip by chip and I would cool it down and nothing happened. Then I would cool it down and nothing happened. And then I cool it down and then it would fail. Okay, great. And then I let it warm up and it would fix itself. And I cool it down again, it would fail. And then I, it would fix itself. And then I did a third time. Okay, okay, it's definitely a chip. And I replaced that and that problem completely went away. But um, yeah, so at any rate, but I have some sort of other problem um, that is causing the game not to work. But uh, anyway, I hope to have it running later today. Um, but yeah, any other questions? All right, well, thank you all for your time. light pens on the screen at the same time? Uh, so the question is, what happens if you use two light pens at the same time? Um, the, the other light pen won't really work. What happens, the way the light pen works is it detects, it, the, we're drawing the lines and there are counters, XY counters that are, that are 
incrementing at different rates. And so what happens is when the light pin sees a flash, it'll latch in that address. So if you point it up at the sky or something like that, it'll latch in an address, but it won't be consistent. It'll latch in an address all the time and stuff like that. So you don't get any consistent address X and Y. So the, the, the program just ignores it. It wants to see a consistent address. Interesting. Yep. Thank you.